Good afternoon, buenas tardes, and thank you for tuning in. On behalf of Mitchell Kaplan, Miami Book Fair, and all of us at Books and Books, I welcome you to a virtual afternoon with Christopher McDougall to discuss Running with Sherman, how a rescue donkey inspired a ragtag gang of runners to enter the craziest race in America. Christopher McDougall covered wars in Rwanda and Angola as a foreign correspondent for the Associated Press before writing his best-selling book, Born to Run. His fascination with the limits of human potential led him to create Outside the Magazine web series, Art of the Hero. To moderate this afternoon's conversation, we're joined by Hope Torrance. Hope is the moderator of the Breakfast with Hope book club at Books and Books and is the museum educator and director of the Fine Art of Healthcare program at the Low Art Museum, University of Miami, where she's worked since 1999. Throughout this afternoon's broadcast, you're invited to ask questions by using the Ask a Question feature at the bottom of the screen, and you can order your copy of Running with Sherman from Books and Books below by pressing the green button. We appreciate each and every order and the generous donations from viewers everywhere. And now, without further ado, I'd like to welcome our guests to the virtual stage. Hello, Hope. Hey, Christina. Hello, Chris, welcome. Hey, welcome. Hi. Hi, Chris, thank you so much. I'm so happy you're here. Um, hey. I, I just wanna thank you. I know that you've been traveling back and forth between Hawaii and Lan Lancaster, Pennsylvania. And I believe you are now in Pennsylvania, which is the same time zone as Miami and the, <laughs> the eastern part of the country is in. So I'm um, happy you didn't have to get up at five o'clock to do this. My um, pleasure. Yeah. I just went before we start, I want to thank Books and Books for, for doing this. Um, I have to say this is one of my favorite books of all time. I loved it. And when I after I read it, um, I had hounded, I cajoled, I begged Books and Books to please ask you if you would um, talk about your book, Running with Sherman. So thanks to Books and Books and thank you for being here. And this is just really about you talking about Running with Sherman. I have some questions, um, but I'd like to start out by, um, for those of who, people, those who haven't read the book, maybe you could just give a little bit of background on how you came came to, to write the book. Sure, first of all, I gotta talk about books and books too, because you know, when my first book came out, Born to Run, uh, it was not reviewed at all. It was not, uh, didn't attract any attention whatsoever. To this day, I cannot get Terry Gross to put me on freaking fine air or fresh air. I don't know why. Maybe because I keep calling it fine air. <laughs> and so Born to Run was really an unnoticed book. It was only noticed by booksellers and independent bookstores. Mm -hmm. And we start getting these little hits from places like Books and Books that were interested and would invite me in to do these events. And so, listen, man, I know there are a lot of places you can buy books maybe for a few pennies cheaper. But those places are not creating events like this. You know, it's your local independent bookstore that is making, putting you and I together for this kind of event. So, you know, I, I would bleed for those kind of bookstores. And I just hope everybody out there understands that by buying their books from a place like Books and Books, you are creating events like this. So yeah. I feel pretty passionately about it, as you can see. Um, it's to the point where I almost forgot what your question was, but you wanted to know more about running with Sherman. Mm -hmm. So. Here's the weird thing, Hope. Every time in my entire writing career, when I started to work on something, I, I kind of knew what it was. I knew what the story was, how I was going to approach it, and, and really why I was writing it. This is the first time that the story was unfolding in my hands, and I had no idea what the heck was going on as I was starting to write it. What happened was when my daughter was nine years old, going on 10, we made the mistake of asking her what she wanted for her birthday. And, and I really learned a lesson about adolescence at that point is like 10 year olds have this weird brain where they're still kind of like kids and they're also kind of like grownups. So 
they still have the kid brain were like, what do you want? I want a dinosaur. You know, I want an asteroid. They don't understand that some stuff you just can't have. And yet, at the same time, they're kind of adults, so they've kind of seen the world. So when I made the mistake of asking my nine-year-old, what do you want for her birthday? Her answer was a donkey. Like, she wanted a donkey. And my first impulse was like, dude, you're not getting a donkey. It's not happening. But then my second thought was like, you know what? Uh, maybe why not? Because, we you know, where we lived was a place called Peach Bottom, Pennsylvania. Very rural, mostly Amish. In fact, I was just down there 30 minutes ago. I just made it back in time. So I went, it's strawberry season. So I went down to our neighbor's farm to buy a bunch of strawberries. And uh, it is so vast and remote. It's the 1800s down in Peach Bottom. We had you know, a five acre farm that we lived on. And we had once met a woman riding a donkey through the woods with a saddle on. And that's what gave my daughter the idea. So she said, it, my first thought was ain't happening. Second thought was like, you know what? We, got the, we have the space, we got the fencing. I can sort of see the fact that a nine-year-old, a donkey looks kind of like kid-sized, you know? It's not giant like a horse, mm -hmm. it's kind of like a mini horse. So we said, okay, let's get a donkey. The only problem was there really aren't many donkeys in Pennsylvania. It's, it's a Rocky Mountain kind of Colorado animal. It's not a Lancaster farm country animal. So we started asking around our neighbors. And one of our neighbors actually said, hey, you know what? We know a guy with a donkey. It's kind of a bad situation. This could be a win for everybody because you want a donkey and he has got to get rid of this donkey because he's a hoarder. He's got this thing locked up. It's in terrible shape and we got to get it out of his hands. And that's how we ended up taking this animal Sherman out of this hoarder's barn and bringing it to our house. Hmm. Wow. Okay. So you, you got Sherman and I know he was in, not in good shape. Um, and I believe it was Tanya McKee who helped helps with Sherman um, recuperate. And what did what what happened? At so the, at, some point, at some point, Hope, I'm going to turn the tables on you and ask you what the fine art of healing is because I'm very curious about that. But so let's tuck that away. But before I get to that, because I have a feeling that what I'm about to say might answer my own question because what I found is that. I come from a, a family that you just don't ask for favors. You don't borrow money. You don't ask for help. You do things yourself. You know, this is old world Sicilian kind of upbringing. Hmm. And it's very uncomfortable for me to ask people to do things for me or to, to ask for favors. I just don't like it. But in this situation, we had a donkey that we had taken away from a hoarder. I'd never had a donkey before. And he was so drastically sick. Um, he had been kept locked up in a tiny little dungeon stall for years. His hooves were so overgrown, he couldn't walk anymore. He was covered with parasites crawling through his fur. His digestion was a mess. Uh, he was on the verge of dying for any one of a number of chronically um, acute syndromes. So that woman I mentioned before, like we said we'd seen a woman riding a donkey through the woods one time. So I started to ask Grandly, hey, anybody know who that woman is? And apparently in Peach Bottom, if you are a woman riding a donkey in the woods, like everybody knows who you are. So like, oh yeah, it's Tanya. Like here, here's her phone number, give her a call. So I call up this stranger out of the blue and say, hey, uh, you're Tanya, my name's Chris. We just got this donkey, uh, it seems to be really sick. And I think before I finished the word sick, she was hanging up the phone to get to our house. She's like, all right, I'm on my way, bang. 15 minutes later, she's in my driveway calls her husband over, who's a farrier who trims hooves. And between the two of them, they looked at this animal, which really, they said, listen, the, the best move would be to put it out of its misery right now. Uh, it's in a recover. But the second move was, but we're going to put everything we have into trying to heal this animal. And this woman from that moment on just dedicated herself, a very busy woman with a farm of her own, to saving this, this donkey's life. And I'll, I'll always be so grateful for, to her for not only doing it, but sort of opening my eyes to the fact that, you know, sometimes when you ask for a favor, it, it allows people to show who they really are. You know, in a way, by asking you for a favor, you're doing a favor. You're letting that person shine and show their best self. And Tanya is a tough cookie, man. You know, I would not want to get sideways with Tanya on a bad day because she would rip your throat out. But 
she's so full of wisdom and strength and compassion that asking for his favor, let Tanya be uh, a superstar. That's great. And so she, um, she gave you some advice about um, donkeys, did she not? Now, when I say, when you say gave me some advice, I mean, that, that thing I said about getting sideways with her. So there's this moment where she has these shears and she's like cutting all this rotten, matted fur off the donkey because it, it is so infested with parasites and matted. And, and she's she getting angrier and angrier the more she trims this donkey because she sees how sick he is and how badly he's been treated. And she's all this like pent up frustration at how he's been treated. And she had to vent it. And so she vented it on me. So at one point as she's shearing the donkey, she kind of wheels around and puts those shears up in my face. And she goes, listen, if you think you're just going to put this donkey on a field with a goddamn ribbon on his butt like Eeyore, you're going to kill it. You got to give this donkey a job. I mean, again, I got these like shears approaching my eyeballs and I'm, I'm like promising anything. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. All right. I'll, I'll give him a job. But like, I, I don't have a job for a donkey. I'm like a pro, I'm not like a prospector. <laughs> even as I'm making this promise, I'm thinking, what am I going to do for a job for a donkey? And that's when the wheels started to turn about the only job that I knew of that I could actually do with a donkey, which was turn it into my running partner. And how how did that happen? I mean, how did you find out about the, the donkey race in Leadville, Colorado? I mean, were you doing research on what to do with a donkey or how did, how did that happen? <laughs> it was... Um, yeah, it's one of these weird things. I don't believe in any kind of like supernatural stuff or, you know, fate or any kind of stuff. Uh, you know, everything has a purpose. I don't, I don't buy that. At the same time, like weird stuff happens. So what had happened was 10 years earlier. Let me see if I can get the cause and effect right. What happened here? 10 years earlier. Oh, yeah. So it, it was a sequence of coincidences, which all kind of created a 10-year timeline. The first thing was. I had gotten an assignment from the New York Times Magazine to go to Mexico in search of a Mexican pop star who actually lives somewhere near Miami at Gloria Trevi. Uh, it was a back then it was a massive Mexican singing pop star, and at the time was accused of or suspected of running this brainwashing sex cult, taking her entourage singers and brainwashing them into sex slaves for her manager. So this is my assignment from the New York Times Magazine. And you would think that that would be a pretty engaging assignment, right? Um, but while I was in Mexico, I got sidetracked because I heard about a tribe called the Tarubara, oh. who runs like, fantastically long distances. So I veered off of the Gloria Trevi sex cult uh, story to go check out this other story about the Tarubara. And it turns out that this, this uh, a group of runners from this tribe had gone to Leadville, Colorado in the mid 90s to run a hundred mile race. So after I got back from Mexico, I go to Leadville to research this race. You know, what happened when the Tarahumara from Mexico came to Colorado to run a hundred miles? And while I was there, the race director said, hey, you should come back in August, man. We do this cool thing called the, pack, the World Championship Packboro Race where people run next to their donkeys for 27 miles. So I said, all right, I'll, I'll check this out. So I came and again, this is like, I don't know, 10, 10 or 11 years before we got Sherman. I go back to Leadville to try out this race. Now, uh, Packboro Racing is a throwback to the old prospector days back when, you know, a prospector would strike gold, throw all this gear on the back of a donkey, and then just run to the nearest town to register the claim. Hmm. So, you know, this is back in the 1800s, so 100 years later, 1950s in Colorado, the miners were still doing this for fun. You know, even though mining had gone underground into tunnels, they still had the donkeys. And so, like on weekends, they would get their donkeys and just like run from like Leadville across the mountains to Fair Play, drink their faces off, and then get trailered home. So to this day, they still do these pack burrow races. So I went to Leadville that summer, the summer of whatever it was, 2005, to check out what pack burrow racing was like. Someone gave me a donkey. They gave me a rope. It's going to be a 22-mile run in the mountains. It was horrible hope. As, as your new friend, I advise you, don't do it. Everything about it was horrible. Because, you know, I don't plan on it. I don't even run for a bus. So what, what's, what, what's, what's the number one thing donkeys are, are famous for? 
I guess, packing or uh, carrying stuff, right? right. Or, as, a, as a disposition, you know, you would say a donkey oh, is stubborn, right? Are they no, yeah. exactly. A donkey is stubborn. Stubborn as a mule, right? Right. Which means that when you're running 22 miles, he doesn't necessarily have the same plan for that afternoon. <laughs> so my donkey just stopped at one point, you know, uh, and just said, I ain't going anywhere. And just hours, and I'm pulling, pulling. So I remember finishing that race, handing the rope back to the owner and saying, dude, if I never run with a donkey again, it's, it's too soon. So then 10, 11 years go by, and now I got this donkey in my yard seriously sick a woman waving sharp object at my eyeballs saying you better find it a job it has to move it needs a purpose it needs to move its legs it needs to feel alive again you need to give it a job i'm racing my brain like what what job like all right there's that pat burr race in colorado i like to run every day maybe if i can train this donkey to be my running partner we can go do that race and that's how i got this idea of like yeah you know what this thing i said i'd never do again maybe that's the one thing that will help save this donkey's life. So you began the training, but you didn't begin with other donkeys, did you? You began with, did you begin with a goat, your goat? Or yes. how did that well, work? We, yeah, we didn't have donkeys. I, I, didn't, I didn't know anything. So I'm looking at this sick donkey. Uh, it just had its hose trimmed for the first time in years. It had just been shaved off of this matted fur. Uh, it's bewildered. It doesn't know what's going on. It hasn't seen daylight before. It's out, out in daylight. It, it doesn't trust humans because humans have not treated it very well. So everything was kind of stacked against us for this possibility of trying to make it run. Mm -hmm. And I'm kind of looking at this thing and think, I, I don't even know where to start. And we had this donkey called Lawrence. Uh, and Lawrence, I'm sorry, donkey, this goat called Lawrence. We had a lot of goats and sheep. That's what we raised on our farm. And Lawrence was the biggest pain of all of them. He was the most charming. He was really a lovely goat, um, but he's annoying because he could jump really high and he was super social. So what he would do in the morning is like the little kids would come and catch the school bus at the end of our lane. Uh, Lawrence would just jump the fence and go over with the school kids. And they're all like scratching him on the head like, hey, Lawrence, how you doing? The bus pulls up, doors open up, kids walk in, and Lawrence just climbs up on the school bus. And the kids are delighted, and the bus driver was delighted once and then pissed off every day after that. So I got a, a school bus driver honking the horn at 7 in the morning saying, get your, get your donkey, or get, sorry, get your goat. So the thing about Lawrence was he was lovable but frustrating. Hmm. But he redeemed himself forever the day Sherman showed up because he went right up to Sherman and just cuddled up next to him and just became his buddy like, like that. I don't know why. And they became inseparable. So what we discovered is that Sherman would follow Lawrence. So our way of beginning this training was just to put Lawrence on a leash like a dog and walk him out the door. And then Sherman would just follow him. Hmm. And that's where he got the wheels turning. He's like, okay, he likes to follow. He wants to be part of a group. Uh, maybe we'll try with my daughters. So I would go out with my daughters and one would go in front and want to have the rope. And as long as Sherman was surrounded by a little bit of a mini herd, he was pretty happy. Mm -hmm. And so over time, what we discovered was the way to solve the problem of one donkey is to just keep throwing more donkeys at the problem. So Tanya ended up bringing over a second donkey and a third donkey. And we had a little mini herd of three donkeys just kind of surround Sherman with. That's amazing. And so um, how long... I'm sorry. I think it was, was it a year that you trained for this race? How, how long did you train for this race? Scratch under a year. So I guess we got uh, Sherman in like that summer, September, I think it was. And the Pack Burrow race was going to be in July. And so that's what I started to think of. Like, okay, let, you know, maybe we have a fighting chance of taking him from being chronically acutely ill. And let's just see if we really push it. Because, you know, what, what I love is, I think I have a quote in the book about, you know, the, uh, the, the path to success is uh, have a plan and not enough time. You know, like that's the secret of success. And that's what we had. Um, because to me, I, I need to have a deadline. I need to, have to, I need to feel like time is running out to really get me consistent and cracking. And so I thought, let's not set a deadline two years away, three years away. Let's set one nine months away. 
So we started this in September, and I'm eyeballing that race in July, which meant we're going to have to get Sherman out every day. Hmm. And I believe you ran into several <laughs> roadblocks and people broke their bones. And I mean, what what was it that sort of kept you or who and what kept you kind of motivated and going and pushing you towards in that direction? You know, it was a couple things. Um, so, you know, one, the real big concern I started to have early on is, am I getting people into trouble with this? You know, I, I get excited about things. I get impulsive. I don't always tap the brakes. And if it's just me, that's cool. You know what? If I, if I get hurt, that's fine. My plan, my fault, my consequences. But, you know, I mentioned that we started throwing more donkeys at the problem. So, you know, Tanya brought over her big riding donkey flower. We thought, okay, cool. Like Tanya will ride flower and Sherman will follow flower because Tanya doesn't run. And that way we can start to run. But the difficulty is flower is big enough to ride, but flower is kind of a big fraidy cat. And so he would always get afraid of things. You see like a little Burger King wrapper on the ground. And I was scared the hell out of him. And he would turn around and try and get behind Sherman. And Sherman is trying to follow Flower. So then Sherman's trying to get behind Flower, who's trying to get behind Sherman. And it becomes like a like a toilet bowl. And the two of them are swir you know, swirling around. And me and Tanya are in the middle. So that's when Tanya got the idea of like, hey, you know what? She has another donkey named Matilda, who's tiny, but super brave. And so she brings Matilda over, but the problem is we don't have anybody to run with Matilda because it's just me and Tanya. So that's when we recruited my wife, Mika, who really had no part, plan to be any part of this operation. So suddenly she's holding Matilda's rope. Um, and that was the thing was, you know, now I've got Tanya and Mika and Flower and Matilda all part of this plan. So if anybody gets hurt, you know, it, it's my fault. If Tanya gets thrown off her donkey, if if Mika gets kicked by her donkey and you know, breaks a kneecap, it's because of me. And then it became further complicated when we got a phone call one day from a good friend whose son was in college and was undergoing a seriously difficult battle with clinical depression. And he was home to try to heal himself. And they wanted him to come by to go running with me, you know, just as part of his path to recovery. If he's out every day in nature going on a run, exercise can help stabilize moods. And I told Andrea, look, yeah, I'm happy to have your son come over, except these days we're running with donkeys. Are you guys cool with that? She's like, whatever. So, uh, sorry, that's my weird thing. Um, so when we took Zeke on board, it was a breath of like new energy, but at the same time, it was like one more person to be concerned about. So I had these two influences at work. On the one hand, every time it seemed like we hit a roadblock, someone would step up. Tanya, <clears throat> first it would be Tanya, then it was my wife, then it's Zeke. But at the same time, I was also having these qualms about whether this was a bad idea, whether I was gonna be sort of luring these people into a situation where someone could get seriously hurt. And how did you work through that? Did you work through that with them? I mean, how was how did that happen that you I you know you you obviously had you said serious doubts about it. Um, but did you express it to to the people that you were that group? No. I'm a, I'm a guy, you know, that's, that's, that's <laughs> talking about emotions. That's not going to happen, you know. I'm talking about it now <laughs> 2 years later. At the time, no, if, if it's an emotional subject, I'm going to keep it to myself, uh, unfortunately. I think what I did was that I just kind of watched and thought and sort of worried privately. But what I did see was the response. So the first day this guy, Zeke, this, this 20-year-old boy who was having difficulties with depression. And I tell you, Hope, man, if you want to understand – the mystery, like the, the tragic mystery of depression, you got to see this kid Zeke, super handsome. Like this kid could be on the cover of Sports Illustrated. Super athletic, like chiseled, handsome, super kind, charming, unbelievably smart. To this day, I cannot tell you what the hell he majored in because I don't even understand 
the words coming out of his mouth. He's actually right now getting a PhD from uh, from Berkeley. So this guy ticking all the boxes, handsome, kind, compassionate, smart, charming, and yet stricken by depression, feels mm -hmm. no reason to live. Um, the first day he shows up, I did not want him running with Sherman because Sherman was the most difficult, mischievous, stubborn, uh, just the most complex creature to deal with. I want him something simple. But Zeke looked at Sherman. He's like, oh, yeah, I'll, I'll try that guy. And he did his first run with Sherman. And from that moment, oh, I get all welled up when I talk about this. The emotion. I don't like it. The first moment that they ran together, Sherman was glued to Zeke's side. It was so funny to see. We ran in a half a mile. We stopped to kind of assess what was going on. And I look over, and Sherman is literally leaning against Zeke's hip, just leaning there like, like he was leaning against a barn wall. And Zeke is talking to me, but not even thinking about it. He's like stroking Sherman and scratching his head. But in a matter of 10 minutes, they became like best buds. So over time, even though – Privately, I was worried about things going south in a bad way. Publicly, like visibly, I could see like, man, you know, Zeke and Sherman are really feeding off each other. Mm -hmm. And, and Nika is having fun. Man. She kind of digs this, this, this experience with the donkeys. Tanya is just delighted by it all. And so I just got these little daily reassurances that even when things were bad, when we were trying to teach the donkeys how to go in the water, which they did not dig, at the same time, everybody pulled together. Everybody had their moment of glory, you know, where Mika, who was the most cautious of all of us, would plunge into the creek with Matilda. I'm like, whoa, where did that come from? And so I just had this feeling of like, man, we are all signing on for this adventure. And it's kind of out of my hands now. That's wonderful. So um, where are these donkeys now? So... Man, this past COVID year was like, nuts for everybody. But so where we lived in Peach Bottom, uh, almost all of our neighbors are Amish and Mennonite, you know, people who drive horse and buggies. And uh, for church and weddings, they have them in their homes. So you'll have like 50 people in one person's kitchen for a church service on, on a Sunday. And uh, they don't drive cars. So when COVID came down, a year ago from now, a year ago now, this month, um, we had to face this hard decision. Like, do we stay here in a very, very rural district with almost no Wi-Fi service at all, with neighbors who don't drive, who don't wear masks and will not wear a mask and will not social distance? And so we made this like impetuous decision. Like, you know what? Let's see if we can sell the farm, rehome the animals and move to my wife's uh, native home in Hawaii. And I, I proposed this and people were, you know, my family staring at me like I was you know, raving. But I, I said, I think I think we can do this. So in a matter of six weeks. So my first phone call was, OK, what can we do with the donkeys? Because the three of them have to stay together and they have to go to a good home. So we had a new farrier, uh, this woman named Leslie. And I called Leslie and said, hey, Leslie, look, this is weird. Do you know anybody who could take three donkeys? And she's like, yeah, this gal. And I go, really? She's like, yeah. You know, I got 150 acres. I already got five donkeys. I'd love to have your donkeys. I'll take them. I want them. I'm like, okay. So she's actually a better farmer than we are. So she took all three donkeys immediately. And after that, it was easy. Uh, Rehoming the, the sheep and the goats was easy. Sold the farm in a heartbeat. And six weeks between me proposing this crazy idea, six weeks later, we all were on a plane and heading to uh, a new home in Hawaii. So right now at this moment, the donkeys are about 20 miles away from me on Leslie's farm. Oh, how interesting. Um, so yeah. you're now, your, your new home is in Hawaii and have you, do you have any animals? Not there. We don't know. Well, we do. We have uh, one rescue cat. So it's kind of funny. So, you know, my, my youngest daughter, Sophie is a junior in high school, but she was born on the farm. So, mm -hmm. uh, she said, um, we were actually looking through photos recently, and she said, every picture you have of me is me waking up with a weird animal. So it's like her waking up in the morning, oh, look, a baby turkey, oh, a baby duck, oh, a baby lamb, yeah, a baby sheep. So uh, she'd been raised around animals her entire life, and now in Hawaii, it's, it's much more difficult to have a little kind of farm homestead. 
but they had a 14 day quarantine. When you first arrive, you stay in your house for 14 days. And the first hour that their quarantine ended, they got in the car and they drove straight to this cat cafe that like the humane society does where the humane society brings like kittens into a cafe and you can have like a latte and watch the cats run around and just pick one out and bring it home. And so literally within 90 minutes of the quarantine ending, they had uh, picked up a rescue cat and brought it back to the house. Oh, nice. Oh, that's so nice. Yeah. Well, Chris, I watched your YouTube video with um, Dr. Horowitz, who um, I had actually seen her speak at a conference I was at in 2016. And she's the dog behaviorist um, and has studied dogs for a while and their behavior. And I was just curious as to how you, if you feel that animals have their own personalities or do you feel that people project their own feelings, their own thoughts, emotions onto those animals? I don't know if you have an opinion on that. Oh yeah, for sure. First of all, uh, people who don't know uh, Dr. Horowitz is, I should, we shouldn't use doctor because it makes her seem like all like distant and, and cerebral because when you meet her in person, right, she's just so vibrant. I saw her because in Phoenixville, Pennsylvania, there's a movie theater that will screen movies and then bring an expert up to discuss it. So they, they screened the film Isle of Dogs, the animated film Isle of Dogs, and they brought up Alexander Horowitz to talk about it. And she was like better than the movie, man. She was just so like charismatic and smart and funny. And I thought if I could ever do a book event with her, I'm just gonna like, you know, knock people out of their seats. So she and I did an event together in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania at a Midtown Scholar Bookstore. And again, she's just so cool and smart. But I, I tell you what she would say, that absolutely animals have their own personality. I'm sure she would say that from a psychologist expert's viewpoint. From my personal experience, I think I've raised maybe 100 or 200 animals over the past uh, 20 years. Absolutely, from almost birth, they exhibit distinct personalities. Mm. And it's, it's, I've seen like, you know, uh, twin goats born, twins, same and mom, same time born, very different behavior, different, very different personalities. Lawrence, mm. I could tell you, I, I, I can almost put a human face on Lawrence. It's not me projecting. This goat behaved very differently than any other goat we ever had. Sherman was very different than Matilda and Flower. So, and, and different in a way that it wasn't just an instinct. It was uh, mannerisms, behavior, sounds, uh, preferences. So absolutely, I think it's an uh, uncontestable point that animals have you know, distinct personalities. So I'm sure you've thought about this, but what is it that you've taken away? You maybe you and your family, you and the people that were involved in all of this. What have you learned from these animals? You know, uh, two things from the experience really imprinted themselves on my mind, uh, and, and I hope if I if I forget them or if I stray from them, then I'm the worst for it. And actually be ashamed of myself because these were such formative experiences that I, I got to remember them. And num number one is, is basically this. If you're trying to persuade a donkey to leave its stall to go for a 10 mile run in the middle of August at 10 o'clock in the morning, that donkey, again, may have very different plans for the day that don't include running 10 miles next to a human. So for you to persuade it and to get it on board with that idea, it's hard enough to get like your brother to agree to where you want to go for dinner, right? You are two verbal creatures that know the same restaurant, like the same food. Hey, I want pizza. I want tacos. You know, you, you have an argument about it. Now take a non-verbal creature that has completely different instincts and then try to get it to understand what you want and sign on for that. And so what I, what I really learned is the secret is shutting down your own desires, trying to understand the other creature, find out what it wants and see if you can sort of channel that. And, you know, I, I just hope I never forget that lesson because it was so productive during those months of working with the donkeys and working with my teammates, my wife and my friend Zeke. To get everybody on board, it just, you had to just dial back your own ego, take a breath, and understand the other creature, see how they're feeling, genuinely feeling, and then get them excited. 
you know, get them inspired to do what it is that you think will be a benefit to everybody. So, you know, rather than demand, you know, inspire. So I don't know if I'm any good at it, but it's, it's one of these missions in my life. Like, you know, be that guy that you were on your best days with the donkeys. But the second thing was that one of the first points we made was also that dialing back your ego. You, know, you don't have to be, you know, Mr. Macho. I can do it myself. You know, let me do it. You know, be expansive. Like, let other people feel the joy of helping. And, you know, dial back your ego to let people help you and ask for favors and ask for assistance. And that's something I'm still struggling with. But every time I've asked for a favor, the way people respond is, oh, yeah, they, they really wanted to do this, you know. So those are the two things, man. You know, just basically all come down to the same thing. Don't be such an egomaniac. Let people help and listen and pay attention to who's in front of you. You should be leading professional development workshops. <laughs> I mean, it's the same thing with people, isn't it? I mean, to let people do what they do best and not to enforce, sort of inflict your own ego and ideas and, and all of that. So it makes complete yeah. sense. I, I am still definitely in the student's chair, you know, not, not in the teacher's chair. It's the best way to learn. Um, yeah. So can you talk about some of the human characteristics that you saw in Sherman at the beginning and did that change in terms of towards the end um, when, when Sherman ran the race or? Yeah, you know, I think, I'm not sure if they changed. You know, the one thing I learned early on with Sherman was, you know, we were trying to get him to walk on the road. He never put his hose on a hard surface before. His hose were very tender and he was uncertain. But most of all, I realized, you know, he's looking at me and he's like, I I've seen this kind of creature before, this thing that walks on two legs, and it has caused all the misery in my life, mm. right? So why would he ever trust another human again. And, and when, when I finally clicked in my, in my mind, I, when, I, when I realized what he must be seeing when he looked at me, I, I was kind of like horrified and thinking, oh, how am I ever going to make contact with this animal? Because he had got no reason to trust me ever. Because people who look like me have caused him a lot of pain. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, I, I think the thing about Sherman was the reason this all worked was because although he was justifiably suspicious and cautious um he was also kind of playful and mischievous and adventurous and once he was given enough of a bodyguard situation once he had lawrence next to him and then flower and matilda once he had his like best blood brother zeke by his side it allowed that mischievous nature that was always there we always sort of see it from the beginning to come out and that was what the really cool satisfaction was, taking this shell-shocked, mistreated, neglected animal and watch it over time, just kind of like surveying the landscape, like, okay, eh, let me see what kind of shit I can stir up today. He would do things like, you know, in the morning, my wife and I are having coffee until 8 o'clock in the morning. We hear, like, car horn time. We don't have many cars on our road. Like, it's like one and a half. We are toll horn our friend. Like, what's going on? All the animals, all the donkeys, the sheep, the goats, they're all out in the middle of the road. Like, what the hell? My wife and I are accusing each other. You didn't lock the gate. I locked the gate. No, you didn't. Because look, they're outside in the road. We would heard them all back in. We closed the gate up. And then an hour later, we hear the horns again. All the animals on the road again. And then we realized what was going on. Sherman, and only Sherman, had figured out if he grabbed the chain from the gate in his teeth, if he like rocked his head, he could throw the chain off and then knock the gate open with his head and just like lead the stampede out in the road. The second we would close the gate, he'd be working on it again. So that kind of stuff. He wasn't going anywhere. <laughs> and leading his like little POW escape. I just thought you did such an amazing job of not just sort of writing from the perspective of other people, but you almost were able to get inside the hooves of um, these animals and, you know, from their perspective, it was, it was really wonderful. And I found myself so many times laughing and crying and just feeling that this book is a book of healing for so many people and animals and um, just wondered if you got that same sense after two years later, um, 
that you felt that it was that? Oh, for, for sure. I mean, here's the weird thing about it, Hope, was I don't know if it was coincidence, but it seemed like all the people that were drawn to this adventure we were on were people who had gone through very tough times themselves and had some attachment to animals. And I, I, I'm, I haven't completely um, untangled what that cause and effect is, but even like the Virginia ladies. So, you know, one of the problems we had was, okay, you know, we're in shape, we're ready for this race, except we're in Pennsylvania and the race is in Leadville or Fair Play, Colorado. It's 3,500 miles away. How do we get three donkeys across the country? And then Tanya had an accident and she couldn't drive the trailer. I couldn't, I didn't have a trailer. And these two women just kind of pop up almost at a random and volunteer and they show up. One woman was you know, 74 years old and you know, strong as a lumberjack. So, but they had come through a, situ a situation where one of the women, Karen, had gone through two narrow escapes from cancer. Uh, was close to death twice. Hmm. And found her healing through her association bond with, with horseback riding and all of her friends on horses rallied around her. So, you know, absolutely. It, it was not only the fact that we took this animal who was sick and worked to heal him. And then this young man who was sick and he found healing as well, but Tanya and Karen and Linda and everybody else who sort of came to the rescue also had these, close calls with the ends of their lives and, and found a connection and a healing and a strength through their bond with animals. And then the ability to reach out and help somebody else heal the same way. So absolutely, I feel like this entire book, the whole story was just drenched with the sense of people trying to find something in the world, the natural world to help them find strength again. And it must just be reinforced having seen this last year and the people who went out and adopted animals. And, you know, I mean, I have a, I live alone, I have a dog and she saved me. I'm having to take her out, taking her for walks, being in nature um, was a huge part of my own self therapy, if you will. I was fascinated by what you learned from the Amish. Can you talk a little bit about that? I could talk a lot about that uh, to the point where people would start clicking off and going to have lunch. Um, <laughs> it's it's a weird thing, Hope. So, you know, I, I'd never been around Yamish. You know, I grew up in Philadelphia. And it's funny, even though Lancaster is, I don't know, an hour drive from Philly, nobody from Philly ever goes to Lancaster. You know, not unless you know, maybe they're going to Dutch Wonderland to the theme park. But, you know, if you're in the city, you stay in the city. You don't go out to farm country. And so my, my conception of the Amish was that there were these very like dour, stern, you know, sort of forbidding, like weird yeah, medieval throwback people. And I mean, that was my impression up until the day we moved onto a farm where all of our neighbors in every direction were Amish. Uh, I thought I'd be surrounded by these like tough old, like German monosyllabic, you know, uh, museum pieces. And instead, I, I found something so dramatically different. Uh, and it should have been, should have made sense earlier that, you know, people who don't communicate with their thumbs, you know, people who don't spend their lives staring at screens, communicate by telling stories, they're face to face. They're very warm, social, um, welcoming people, and they actually, I believe, is maybe the only religious group. I know of that actually lives by the stuff they say they believe in, you know, and I'll just be off on Christians because you're in Florida, man, but you guys got some of the worst Christians in the world, you know, some of the meanest people in the world are Christians. And I, I, I bet you, if you take a head count of all the people who stormed the Capitol on January 6th, I bet you every single one of them will say they were Christian, right? Yet they don't act like this dude that they say they believe in. Like how many guys stormed the Capitol? are actually acting in a Christ-like manner. None of them, right? Yet the Amish, who are devout Christians, and the way they express that is like, huh, what would Christ do? And maybe we should try to do that as well. So they are devout pacifists. They are kind. They are super honest. They're gentle. They're sharing. Their entire economy is based on sharing. The Amish don't have health care. 
Mm-hmm. So if someone gets seriously sick with cancer or has a heart attack, the only way they pay their bills is if everybody else in the community chips in and pays the bill with them. Uh, they believe in adult baptism, not infant baptism. So you can only join the Amish church as an adult. So when you step into the faith, you're stepping into it as someone who's made a conscious decision. You know what you're getting into. You've made a conscious choice. They have a thing called Rumspringa, uh, which is called uh, basically running wild. So teenagers, before they join the church, are encouraged, like, hey, dude, go out, buy yourself a pickup truck, get yourself a pair of board shorts, like go live the modern life all you want. Get yourself an iPhone, knock yourself out. But then at some point, make the choice. You either want to live the modern lifestyle. If so, you know, good for you, have a good time. Or you can leave all that aside and make a conscious choice to join this community. So when people join the church, it's not because they were sort of brought up into it or coerced into it. It's because as adults, they made a conscious choice that this lifestyle is what I believe is the best way to live um, with my family. And so, you know, I'm sort of at, at a division. I, I don't want to wear long black pants every day. You know, I, I don't believe like uh, men should like sort of rule the community the way the Amish do. At the same time, I look at them and think, man, they are. there are a lot, a lot, a lot of life lessons that I believe in. Uh, I want to be as kind, as gentle, as honest, as compassionate, um, and as family-oriented as they are. Oh, that's great. Uh, that's a, a wonderful place to, I think we're at the point where um, people might want to ask questions. So yeah. I'm, going to, I'm going to field some uh, questions. If anybody has questions, you can just um, type it into the ask a question box at the bottom of the screen. One of the questions is, what are you working on next? Oh, man. It's funny that people always ask that question, like, uh, <laughs> because it, it, you sound sort of, or I sound kind of uh, mean when I say it's kind of the last thing I want to talk about, you know. Uh, so when you're working on something, for two reasons. Number one is you don't want to talk it out. You don't want to talk about it so much you're bored of it. And the second thing is you don't want to be sort of getting things out into the circulatory system that could end, then end up being, you know, used somewhere else. So. Uh, I think anybody, anyone who's working on something knows to just keep the mouth shut. Okay. Well, we'll, we'll look forward to, to seeing what it is that you come up with. Thanks. Um, let's see. Is there another question? Hope never answered the question you asked her. <laughs> Somebody said that. I don't know what you asked me. I don't remember what you asked me. <laughs> What's the fine art of healing? It's actually called the fine art of healthcare. Okay. Um, and I work in an art museum, and we use art as a tool to hone skills with people who are um, about to go into the healthcare field, which is nursing, physical therapy, um, medicine. Um, and we believe that art, like medicine, is a practice. And looking at art and talking about art is about people's perspectives and their interpretations. And so what we're trying to do is to get people to understand that there are these connections when they come into an art museum and they sit down in front of a work of art and talk about it um, that somebody might have a completely different perspective because of their background knowledge and their um, experiences and the same in medicine so a nurse spends more time with a patient than a doctor Um, so listening to the nurses uh, could be very important in terms of a diagnosis even or the, the treatment and the care that a, that a patient will get. It's also a way in which um, we think art helps people listen better, if that makes sense. So when people are talking about art, to really listen to what people are saying, and we have them do things like paraphrase back what somebody says, so that they really understand, people who are talking really understand that by doing that, people are really listening to what they're saying. And listening is a huge part of um, that practice. And I think medicine has come to the point where people understand it's not just about the doctor telling a patient what they should do. It's more about a a negotiation. It's about a relationship that's cultivated between um, a healthcare provider and their their patients. So let me ask you a question, Hope, because it sounds like this would 
pertain to what you're saying. Uh, I have a really good friend in Hawaii who, um, smart, really smart, progressive, open-minded thinker, very health conscious, will not get vaccinated. And the conversation I have with them, I feel like it's a failure on my part to understand where they're coming from. And so interesting. It, yeah, it's so interesting that you say that because the New York Times came out with an article just today right. on what you should be doing when you t are talking to people who haven't been vaccinated, which is showing a sense of compassion. Instead of lecturing somebody or being dogmatic about it, you say, I want to understand from your perspective, you know, and, and people are much more apt to sort of talk about their fears and talk about what's going on with them versus standing there and telling them they should because this is why and people shut down. Um, it's like anything, you know, if you want to show a sense of compassion, it's better to close your mouth and listen to that person. But it's interesting. So do you feel that pertains to the kind of educational work you're doing with healers? Uh, that, that kind of scenario, because it sounds to me as if, I imagine if you're a, a doctor or a nurse dealing with a patient and you can't get them to sign on to the program, like you know as a professional, this is what you gotta do, and the person isn't getting it. Uh, is the kind of work you're doing designed to break down those communication barriers? Yes, and the other thing I've learned, I was married to a, a Catalan a man from Barcelona, for many years, and he uh, got uh, pancreatic cancer. He died in 2016, but I realized his language skills, um, his sense of his sense of who he was, his value system was different than a lot of medical people that he came into contact were used to. And so, being compassionate and being culturally humble, I guess, is the terminology that they're using nowadays, which is being open to other people's value system. Um, and even language um, can be very helpful to a healthcare provider if they are open to that versus shutting down and saying, well, you don't come from America or you don't speak English or you have a set, different set of values than I do. So I'm not going to even try with this. But it's, right. you know, it's it's not easy, but it's, you know, the program has been going on for 11 years and it's it's an interesting program. Yeah. I'd love to talk. I'd love to talk to you more about sort of how we can bring in, you know, the the understanding of animals to to and sort of dealing with animals. Um, I know that animals are used in therapy and um, help to heal in all sorts of different ways. But anyway, that's in a nutshell what what we do. You know, it'd be a funny thing to do. It, it probably doesn't fall in the parameters at all. But um, every once in a while, I'll bump into somebody who's out trying to run with their dog, and um, there's a great uh, running shoe store in Charlotte, North Carolina called the Ultra Running Company. And I was running out, I was out for a run with the owner of the store one day. We were in the woods and we came across this woman trying to run with her dog and the dog was like, you know, pulling the leash and running in circles. And I said, do you mind if we just try something, just an experiment? And I said, hey, Nathan, you get in front of the dog and the dog's owner get right close to the dog on one side. I'll get close on the other and let's just run, the three of us. And the dog got it like that instantly. Oh, wow. And then we ran two miles and the dog was like, oh, I get it. Like, this is what we're doing. And this ran like straight as an arrow. Because and you were I, next to the dog? Because you, you were next to the dog, is that right? We surrounded the dog. So one, person, the dog. one was on the left and one was in front. And the dog was basically in the middle of a pack. And you go, oh, here's a leader. Oh, okay, this is my left, this is my right. Oh, everybody's running. I guess this is what the job is. Prior to that, he didn't really know. He's at the end of a leash. He's smelling things. He's going all directions. And that, that's basically the same thing we did with the donkey. We just surrounded Sherman with a pack, and he just got with the flow. Now, since then, I've done this, I don't know, maybe a dozen other times where I'll come across somebody running with a dog. And say, Let's just try this experiment. Let's just surround the dog and run eyes forward. And it seems to always work. So, man, I would love as an experiment, Hope, if it ever works out, if you hand it a leash to a young doctor, it's like, okay, you know, get this dog to run across the field. What a know? great idea. I love that idea. Yeah, <laughs> well, and, you know, in a way you're making, a, you're, you're, you're talking about a metaphor, and that's a, a healthcare provider running alongside their patient. Yes. And, and that's and, exactly what it is. And the first thing the, doc, the doctor's going to realize, well, you know what? Imposing my will ain't working on this situation. Exactly. 
let's bring somebody else in somebody else and then all of a sudden and when it works there's that shock of recognition like oh i get it like i was frustrated a second ago and now i'm fulfilled yeah you know and what made the difference was paying attention so i know it's a really fun experiment but i, I do it a lot because you know everybody wants to run with their dogs and they can't but when they find a solution they're so grateful mm. Yeah, my dog's too old to run anymore. <laughs> you have a, another question. Um, what was what is the one thing you love most about Sherman? Oh man, his uh, <laughs> it's also the same thing that drives me craziest. But his uh, his spirit. Same was with Lawrence, and maybe that's the reason why these two ding dongs, you know, bonded so quickly, Lawrence and Sherman, because they had that same like kind of twinkle in their eye and. It, it's funny because when we first got Sherman, we took him away from the hoarder. We brought him back to our place. He stood there and his eyes were dead, like dead fish eyes, almost glassy. Mm. Seeing nothing, nothing's coming in. And then when Lawrence was around him, he kind of lightened up a little. And then over time, when he, we started to run with him, when he met Zeke, he had this little, I have a picture, it's actually in the book, of Sherman kind of like following our, our cat Polly around. And you look at the look on Sherman's face, he's like, I know this cat hates me, which is exactly why I'm going to put my nose right up his butt. And the cat's like, dude, enough, boundaries. And the donkey is just like right there. And you look at the look, and you can see it in the book. You know, you see that, that look in Sherman's eyes like, yeah, I know he hates it. That's why I'm doing it. And so that thing I liked most about Sherman was when he got his, his spark back, uh, it never left. He was just this fun, mischievous. Oh, he would do his thing. So people would come over to the house and uh, they would see the donkeys get really excited and they'd be petting Matilda and petting Flower. At one point, this girl is, you know, petting one of the donkeys and I'm, I'm paying attention somewhere else. And she goes, excuse me, excuse me. Um, he's biting me. And I look over and Sherman has taken her arm in his jaw and has pulled her arm away because she's paying too much attention to flower. So he literally just like, mm. he, just, he didn't bite her. He just like, took her hand and pulled it away. I'm like, dude. And he would do that all the time. If somebody else would get more attention, he would just come over and like, take him by the pants, by the arm, and just pull them away oh, from the other dog. Hilarious. Yeah. <laughs> There's another question. Uh, it is, when did you realize that Sherman's story would make a fantastic book? Were you writing it while you were working with him, or did you begin writing once the race ended? So that's a great question because I should start off by, by saying that I never finished the uh, close the loop and finish the thought. Um, I get a phone call one day from an editor of mine that I've worked with at, at the New York Times called Tara Parker Pope. Oh, and no. oh, fantastic! Great, great science editor, great health writer. And she called up. I, I forget why exactly. Um, maybe kind of brainstorm some ideas for stories and she's like yeah so what, what are you working on these days and i'm like yeah you know i'm actually taking a little bit of time out i got this donkey we're trying to keep alive and it's really occupying a lot of my time and she goes oh that's gonna be a great book i'm like Ty, uh tyra I don't, I don't think this thing's even gonna live you know so and she's like that's why it's gonna be a great book like you don't know where you're going you don't know what the story is and those are the best stories the ones where you don't know what's happening next you get all the emotion and the mystery because you're living it and I'm like that's pretty damn smart so I started taking notes uh at mm -hmm. that moment and like this is going to lead where it's going to lead and so I had that rare opportunity of capturing in real time the actual kind of befuddlement or frustration or you know uh, bewilderment that I would have uh, I was actually writing it like that day um and then, so I didn't really know. It wasn't like me telling a story that's already happened. It was me telling the story as it's happening. Oh, great. Yeah. Wonderful. Um, another question. What happened to Sherman's previous owner? Did he read Running with Sherman? Did he change his ways? You know, there, there was a real epiphany that I had, um, which is that, you know, we, <laughs> so I, I mentioned the Amish and Mennonite are, extremely honest and caring people. So our neighbor, Wes, who was the person who engineered uh, Sherman's liberation from the hoarder, um, the hoarder was a member of Wes's Mennonite church. And 
Wes had been over to his house many times to help him out because they had no money. He spent all the money, you know, feeding these animals, wasn't taking care of his family. So Wes wanted to remove this donkey from the hoarder and all the other animals. The hoarder didn't want to let them go. And Wes does not lie. He tells the truth. But in this case, he had to kind of find a way to, you know, stretch the boundaries of the truth. So he negotiated a deal with the hoarder, said, uh, listen, here's what we're going to do. We're going to take the donkey and give it to Chris for two years. Chris can feed it. He can heal it. He can trim its hooves. And at the end of two years, then we can, you know, we'll revisit this and see what happens. So Wes had no intentions of that donkey going back to this guy in two years. But technically, he was telling the truth. So that was the arrangement was, okay, we're going to get Sherman for two years and the hoarder will have a chance to repair his own life. So it was about a year and a half later. Yeah, it was a year and a half later. I'm actually working the field one day and I noticed the donkeys, like the ears are straight up and they're staring at the fence. And this is the kind of thing they would do if like a coyote or a dog would come around. The, the donkeys are like great watchdogs. So they're like on alert, like watching this threat. And I look over to see what it is, and I realize it's the hoarder who's in my driveway. And he's walking up the driveway. I'm like, oh, boy, <laughs> if he thinks he's coming back for the donkey, he's going to have a hard day today. So I go walking down there, like, ready to, you know, do battle. And I realize he's with his wife and his, his daughters. And uh, they're actually very gentle, kind people. And they came just to visit the donkeys because they happened to be nearby. And they drove by. And they knew where we lived. And... The donkeys wouldn't go anywhere near them. Sherman wouldn't go anywhere near them. He kept his wow. distance. Mm -hmm. And I felt this um, th this moment of clarity. Like this, uh, I understood, like, here's the problem with mentally ill people. They don't see what we see. And so the hoarder loved the donkey, loved it, and thought he was giving a great life to this donkey. He didn't mm -hmm. know that he was killing it. And he was really sad and hurt that the donkey wouldn't come anywhere near him. And when I saw that happen, I saw the hoarder like, hey, hey, you know, like it's in with his wife. You know, mother, he's, he's not coming over. Like, what's, what's wrong? And I, I suddenly saw it. I saw the hoarder through Sherman's eyes, and I saw Sherman through the hoarder's eyes. Hmm. And realized they, they weren't seeing the same thing. And so any, any kind of resentment I had was gone because I realized I'm dealing with a guy who's, who's not well. Uh, and, and quite sadly, he ended up dying of a brain aneurysm. Uh, within a year after that, you know, suddenly and tragically. Uh, so, no, I was left with a sense of real um, sadness, real sadness on his part. Uh, mm -hmm. He didn't see it, never would, and he lost what he thought was it was a real close friend. Was the donkey's name Sherman with when the hoarder had him? No, he called him Shaggy. And uh, as soon as we got into the thing, we're like, it was my daughter, my nine-year-old daughter, who said, no, we, we, we're not going to call him Shaggy. We're not going to call him Shaggy. Like, instantly. And I, I think in her mind, it was like, you know, new name, new life. Hmm. Like, call him something else. So she named him after the Sherman Brothers. We had just seen uh, Saving Mr. Banks, uh, the great hmm. film about the creation of the Mary Poppins um, film. And the, the Sherman Brothers were the guys who created those great uplifting songs. And so she had the stroke of genius. And like, let's call him Sherman. Like, you got it. He's <laughs> Sherman. That's great. That's wonderful. Yeah. I think we're out of time and I really, really want to thank you so much for, um, and I'm really looking forward to your next, whatever you come up with next. I, I'm a yeah. fan, a big fan. And I think there, there were people on here, Christina. Um, this was such a great conversation. Thank you. I think that we need a, a books and books donkey. Like we need a, we need our own Sherman, right? You're, you're talking to the right guy, Christina. I can make it happen for you. Know? Make it happen for us. Seriously. Where we have, keep, where we have like a whole courtyard. We have a courtyard <laughs> and he could hang out there and, and then we can try getting all the doctors to run with him. So <laughs> you tell Mitchell, he I think him. we've got something here. <laughs> <laughs> what what a delight to have you you know with us today. Thank you so much for sharing all of these this great insight. Really, yeah. uh, it was very inspiring and illuminating conversation. Hope I think you brought out some really good some really good things from from Chris and oh, from I, I enjoyed, about I, the I, enjoyed I enjoyed it and thank you, Books and Books again. This I was, was wonderful. It was everything I, I was anticipating and. Ex hoping for. Um, I'm so happy that um, 
we, we live it. to make people's dreams come true. <laughs> That's why we exist. There should, that should be your motto. <laughs> exactly. That that and the, forget you know Jorge Luis Borges. We're gonna make that our motto. I'm sorry, you were saying. But you know what though, like all kidding aside, like that's exactly what you do. That's why I love walking into a bookstore because a that's bookseller cool. will say, Hey, I just read this. This is great. You should try this. Born to Run was hand sold by booksellers, otherwise it would have disappeared and been invisible. So uh, I I feel this real pang of, of loyalty and, and, and uh, I, we're, right. we're a tribe we're a definite tribe the indie booksellers and we stick to get you know we we you know you're one of us so i think you understand and and hope yeah. is like that too so <laughs> thank oh, you thank so you. much for the kind words <laughs> Sure. Thank you, Chris. Great talking and to you. Just reminding everyone who's watching that if you don't already own a copy of Running with Sherman, you can order it by just pressing the green button and we'll ship it out to you. And if you're in Miami and you want to come by one of our stores and pick up a copy, you can do that too. And I hope that we will see you in person sometime soon, Chris. I'll um, be there. Maybe in Miami sometime soon. Okay. Yeah. 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 So thank you yeah. to everyone. Have thank a beautiful you. day. Thank you. Thank you. Wherever Thank you, you are. <laughs> Bye. Bye, Chris. Bye, Christina. Thank